I want, I want uh, to do something with regard to uh, something that, that happened uh, uh, after the service. And it was a good thing because we were teasing. And Nancy Ferries went out, and, and as is her uh, norm, she teased me about. Um, she said, Pastor, it was good to have been here. And I wanted to just explain with regard to that because she, she meant it. Of course, she has, has complimented me many times. And, but I wanted others to understand just in case. I got to thinking, you know, maybe there are those who do not understand what I mean by that. And uh, I knew what she meant. She was teasing. We talked about what we need around here is a lot more sincerity and so forth. And we joked back and forth as we have uh, since we've known one another. Uh, but I got to thinking, you know, maybe maybe somebody doesn't understand what I talk about when I poke fun at those people who do that or when I poke fun at, at what's called a, quote, friendly church, because maybe you're thinking, well, I don't have to be friendly. I don't have to go out of my way to greet people. I, I can just sit back and and uh, be a, an old sire face and who cares? But of course, that's not what I'm talking about. And I always try to preface those remarks by saying, we're grace people, of course we should be gracious. Because we're grace people and realize that we're saved by the grace of God and have that in common with everybody who's saved or will ever be saved, to show interest and concern, we need to be friendly. We need to extend our hand in, in, a, in an act of friendship courtesy, uh, uh, common social things to, to others. So when I poke fun at those things, I'm not talking about us not ever going around and shaking a hand. We should do that, of course. Uh, not ever giving a compliment to a pastor or others. Uh, we have, a, we have a folks like Brian. He compliments the congregation. Good singing. We compliment the special music, the instrumentalists and the singers with, with good singing. We appreciate uh, that song. That's all part of it. Encouragement and so forth is part of the Christian way of life. So I am not talking about that. Giving a compliment, giving a word of encouragement, showing yourself friendly. It's part of it. It's written in Paul's letters, uh, for crying out loud. So it's part of the, our way of life. However, I say that to say that Christianity and uh, those in certain Christian circles have made an issue of friendliness, have made an issue of playing, as it were, games with Pat, the pastor and others by, by giving those compliments, you know. And I've been there, and I've been in this business a long time. And I knew of people who were con artists and they would go out and, and instead of from a heart of genuineness say, Pastor, I, I really enjoyed that. that. That enlightened me. That helped me. Or I really enjoyed that song. You knew that they could care less about the Christian way of life. And they were, they were just trying to con you. They were, as it were, lying to your face. Yeah, I'm here. I put in my time, but I'm glad it's over. <laughs> You're not going to see me again till Christmas. And you knew you could read it in their eyes. You knew looking down deep in their soul, they were not genuine. It was just an act. It was just an attempt to, to have the pastor, you know, I'm some kind of sort of special guy. I've got my collar on backwards. And so therefore, uh, I'm this special guy that can, can give you blessing. It just oozes from my fingers. You know, I just throw it this way and throw it that way and you're blessed. And, and just, if I just think that these people are somehow spiritual, it's going to make them feel better. And of course, that, that is wrong. Now, I can give blessing, but my blessing is using my gift to feed my sheep, having my sheep ingest it and utilize that in their lives. That's the chain of command. That's the channel of blessing. But having somebody who is, quote, insincere go out and say, Pastor, it was good to have been here as a ploy just to con me or any other pastor into trying to make you think there's some sort of righteousness now about you because you've been in a service that's not true I've seen people in services vibrate 
I'm talking about being under such conviction and fighting it with such heated um, emotion against God and what the preacher was saying. I've seen them vibrate. I've seen them cry. Uh, now, it's, it's not been for a long time, but I have seen them do it. You get to preaching the gospel and you have somebody in the service who, who hates Jesus Christ. You know, they were there because somebody told them, come see the pastor swallow a goldfish. And they were there just to get a little free entertainment, you know. And then now all of a sudden the pastor turns around and says, you need Jesus Christ. God, the Holy Spirit stuck them in the conscience and they felt guilt. I don't feel good here. And besides that, I don't want Christ ruling my life. Now here I've got another 45 minutes to listen to this Jaybird, and I was gone. Now I'm mad, you know, and that, and that sort of thing. So just because a person comes to church, just because a person comes regularly, that doesn't always mean that that person is there for the right reason, has the right motivation, has the right objectives. Now I've drawn our, uh, our characteristic uh, body, soul, and spirit. Just in order to have a, a frame of reference to, to show what I'm talking about. Most usually, whenever I hold a service, I know in general uh, the, the spiritual status, thrust, interest, pulse of the people I'm dealing with. After all, we see one another on a regular basis. And, and so I, I can generally, you know, sense the temperature of, of their spiritual life. A person who is going to organize their life to be there on a pretty day like this, I mean, <laughs> you, you put things aside, you have sacrificed. You know, you're not out doing what everyone else is doing. And so that, that says something for the group that meets routinely. But um, in a church service, a, a uh, preacher, whether he's an evangelist or a pastor teacher, has often three types of people facing him. Now I know we're this is point uh, this is uh, rather of number eleven in the in the uh, series the doctrine of Israel's remnant. But I'm going to do this. It's sort of given a whole new meaning to hear a little there a little with this doctrine <laughs> because uh, I've done this. I don't I don't mean to, but I, but I just uh, I sense that I perhaps needed to deal with this first so that no one does misunderstand. And we, we joke and, and, and that's fine, but sometimes um, I've sensed others saying, well, am I not supposed to be friendly? No, 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 that's, that's not it. Am I not supposed to shake hands? Oh, no. <laughs> am I not supposed to show common courtesy to others? No, not at all. But you have to understand that if you're here and you have a certain spiritual status and you are looking for someone else to make you feel good or you are doing these things in, in an attempt to either snow somebody else or as a, a self-righteous effort, those things are wrong. And one of the hardest things to do in the, in the Christian way of life is to, is to counteract and combat half-truths. Yes, we shake hands. No, we don't shake hands if we're doing it for certain reasons, you see. <laughs> yes, we show ourselves friendly. But no, we don't show ourselves friendly if, if indeed uh, the, the, the person is, um, is not here for the right reason or we're not doing it for the right reason. Uh, and uh, let, me, um, let me just show you what a speaker faces. We know that the Bible teaches that there are three categories of human being, only three. So when I get up to teach, normally I go, I go through this, this little thing in my head, who do I have here today? Well, if I have someone here that is a natural man, what do I mean by that? Someone who is unsaved, I'm going to still go ahead and present my, my lesson because that's my job. Feeding my sheep is important. But Paul tells Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Timothy was a pastor teacher, which means that if you've got a fish out there waiting to be hooked, don't miss the opportunity. Put the bait on the hook, throw it out there, and hope he bites and reel him in. You know, I'll make you fishers of men. So you try to get the gospel in and aim toward someone who's unsaved. After all, it might be the last opportunity he or she has. So you have that. Okay, but then 
you have people who are carnal. Now, what does that mean? They've been saved. Perhaps they've been part of, of this church or, or whatever. They come regularly or, or not. And they're sitting there, and uh, it's the attitude, okay, preacher, bless me now. Okay, I'm here. Show me your stuff, and, and that sort of thing. They're here totally for the, for the wrong reason. Now, uh, the first thing they have to do before I can ever get through to them is to get right with God. Of course, first thing <laughs> these people have to do is get saved. These people have to get back in fellowship. No amount of teaching on any other subject, on any other category, is going to help either group until group number one gets saved and group number two gets back in fellowship with God. Now, that does bring up a, an interesting concept with regard to fellowship in churches. I have also made, made some remarks against churches who have fellowship. Now again, should we have fellowship? Oh, yes, we should. We should get to know one another. We should love one another. We should encourage one another. We should pray for one another. We should rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Absolutely. But on the other hand, should we have fellowship? And the answer is no. If that person is carnal and they're not going to get right with God and they're going to bring down us in the process of our friendship, I'm sorry, you're inconsequential to, to me or I would be inconsequential to you. Do, do you. do you understand that? You have to. We, we have situations and have had situations in our church where I've taught on inconsequential people because people have asked me, what do I do? I've got this one who is who is yelling at me and that one who is demanding my time. And I just I can't seem to get around all of these obligations. And if I go to church, then I poke fun of I don't hear the last of it and so forth. And I'll tell you what I do. I, I do, 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 you know, put the cross up to them. They're inconsequential. Crucify them, you know, in your mind. But you have to do that. Otherwise, the world will keep you from Jesus Christ. The world will keep you from doing what you should do for him. You must count those people as much as you love them. And they can be family. They can be friends. They can be um, people at work or what have you. They must be considered inconsequential. And that's why we call it the doctrine of inconsequential people. If those people are going to keep you from your responsibilities, uh, to be in fellowship with Christ, looking toward eternity and so forth, then they're meaningless to you. And uh, we've already gone through that doctrine. We're not here to teach it, but I would remind you, the world is, don't hurt, don't hurt their feelings. You know, the world says, oh, but we've just got to get along with one another. Well, look at the life of Jesus Christ. I mean, he comes in the presence of the Pharisees, says you're a bunch of snakes, you know, and, and, and so forth. And that, that's not exactly the, the friendliest act in, in town. Uh, John the Baptist did the same thing. He, he said, who, who told you fellas to get saved? Who told you fellas to flee the wrath to come? Your generation of vipers. It didn't make him popular. But what I'm saying is he knew that the Pharisees were there for, for two reasons. Uh, one, to put him down, and one, to get his followers to come back to, to, to their false church and, and follow them. So they're, they're inconsequential. John was the, the right man sent of God. So you've got uh, these, these two. That brings up the word fellowship. What is true Christian fellowship? If it is just getting together under the name of a church or in the name of Christ or any other religious figure or religion, then other churches have us beat because they have greater numbers, greater times, as we always say, the bigger pizza, the colder Coke, and everybody gets together and talks with one another and they have fellowship, so-called. Well, a long time ago, I got to thinking about this and I thought and I thought, if they're having fellowship, and number one, they're unsaved. Number two, they're either saved and their doctrine is awry and they can't be in fellowship with God. What are they having? And I would say they're having just simply mere social intercourse with other people. You have it at 
the country clubs, <laughs> you have it at, you know, bowling alleys, you have it at the ball games, you have it any place else where you get together with the crowd and talk with one another. It's just simply here you're doing it in the name of Christ and at a church. I know you're 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 pretty you're pretty safe there, as it were. I contend that that is not that is not true Christian fellowship, even here. If people come to our church and they are either a natural man or a carnal man, they, we might love them. We can have a social time with them, but we cannot have Christian fellowship with them. Why? Because the only way you can have Christian fellowship is that that person is a Christian, not just in, in their heart, but in their life. Christian fellowship means more than just being a believer or being in a church. It means being truly a Christian through and through. Christian fellowship means having a, 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 a social time with someone else who is in fellowship with God. If the person is not in fellowship with God and you are, you can't have Christian fellowship with that person. Or if you're in the flesh and they're in the flesh and you're still both believers, you might have a good time together. But that's not Christian fellowship. The first um, order of business for any believer is fellowship with God. Then he and only then can he have fellowship with people. And then and only then is it Christian if the other person is in fellowship. I hope that you're understanding that what I'm giving you is something that is absolutely accurate. It is absolutely in alignment with God's Word. It is not taught in other churches. What is the general philosophy of these churches? The Madison Avenue technique. It's get them there under any pretense. Get them there regardless of how you have to do it. Get them talking to one another. Give them a good time. Get them, get them involved and, and so forth. As long as you're doing that and you're having fellowship, you, you have Christian fellowship and a good time. And that is not true because the natural man doesn't know the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. You can't have fellowship, Christian fellowship with a natural man. As pleasant as that person might be, a uh, good conversationalist, good looking, enjoy the company of that person, uh, has, has a, a lot of uh, funny stories and jokes and so forth. And you just enjoy. A lot of us do. We have unsafe friends. That's, that's not wrong to do that. You have to have those kind of friends to witness to them, of course. But... You must have them at arm's length. You must understand where they are and what they can do to you. If you uh, feel that drawing power back from the Lord Jesus Christ, back to the world, if you enjoy their fellowship more than that of the Lord Jesus Christ, then that, that person should be counted inconsequential. Um, okay, the same thing with a carnal person. Carnal people pose a danger. They're interested in being saved and using Christ as a scapegoat from hell, but they're not interested in having him as Lord of their lives during time. And so therefore, uh, they can pose this to Well, I'm saved. I'm a believer, but I don't have to go study the word all the time. Ah, wait just one second. You go do what you want to do. I know what I have to do to, to stay in fellowship, and that's what I'm going to do. And a carnal person obviously is living as the natural man, the only difference is they're saved. So, but from all outward appearances, the carnal person can act like, be like the unsaved person. Now, um, what, one of the reasons that I always slight this business of, um, of feelings is because in that state, they have rejected the only true solution to life, the spiritual solution. The only way to really make you feel good and have your emotions in check, doing what they should do, appreciate uh, life and God, they reject the spiritual so solution in favor of what? The material one. So, if you're unsaved and you're status quo evil, what is evil? 
the best of life apart from God. Well, what's one of the first things you want to do, therefore, in life? And that's feel good. That's a, it's feel good. You know, you want health and wealth. You want security and you want social times. And so, therefore, that's why people try to go into church and make them that kind of an organization that will make you feel, first of all. And I know that sometimes uh, uh, when we come into church here and the, you're, it's Sunday morning and you've had a bad week and you haven't had your morning coffee and you couldn't sleep last night and you're sitting there and you would just rather have a little pablum rather than a little meat for the morning message and, and you're a little grouchy and you're a little grumpy. You did take the time between home and here to get in fellowship, but uh, it's still, the first thing you want to do is, oh, pastor, don't make me think. You know, <laughs> this is a last bulb. Just make me feel good. And all of a sudden I say, we're going to study the a priori, a posteriori, the a fortiori, and the apperceptional logic in the Bible. Oh, dear God, may the rapture be this morning, you know. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, this is because we don't want to think. What do we want to do? We want to feel. And we, you have to, you have to know that, yes, of course, the feelings are part of it. But Jesus Christ on the cross was battered and bruised. He didn't feel very good. And yet the Bible says for the joy that was set before him is absolutely joyful. Can you imagine? I'm in the will of God. This doesn't feel good, but it's going to be over soon. And just as soon as it's over, it's done forever. And I've accomplished what God wanted me to do. And he's going to praise me forever. That, that gives me a pretty good feeling. Now, but he put thinking or doctrine before his body. He put the spirit before his flesh. And that's why I always sort of talk against and say slighting remarks to feeling. It's not that we don't want to feel good. And it's not that as an end result, being in fellowship with God doesn't make us feel good. It's just that's not the main objective of, of church. The main objective of church is to have you grow spiritually and, uh, and be prepared for battle, which is uh, another uh, situation where people don't always feel that good. But uh, so therefore they appeal to the flesh. Now, a spiritual person is here to do one thing. And that is grow spiritually. That is his first and primary objective. If you're not here to grow spiritually, if that's not the, the, the first uh, uh, priority of a local assembly, it is nothing more than a social club, a country club, where people go around slapping one another on the back, uh, shaking their hands, saying nice things, all in an attempt to make you feel, make you feel apart. Well, I've got news for you. If you're not saved and if you're a carnal, you're not a part of this elite group that is in fellowship with Jesus Christ. I'm, that's the way that it is. I want it different. You see, here I am spiritual and I want you to come to my level. I want you to either get saved or get right. And therefore, we can have true Christian fellowship together. But why are natural people in a church? Why are carnal people in the church? If they're not here to get right and get saved, there's only one other reason, and that's to bring spiritual people down, you see? To make them, see, misery loves company, and the natural man and the carnal man don't feel good. And if I can't, if I can't feel good, then I'm going to make you feel miserable with me. How do I do that? Well, what did Eve do? Eat of this fruit, Adam. Get lost. Don't, don't keep on having a relationship with God. Let's both feel good together. Eat this fruit, let's die and go to hell. And yeah, sure. So that's why you have, have to understand. If, if it is a church where there are natural and carnal people, and they are working the crowd with this touchy-feely uh, nonsense that, that goes on, then they are just trying to keep, get people and keep people there so they'll feel secure, feel good as they walk down this primrose path to hell forever. And of course, uh, a spiritual person says to each of these, and you know, 
often I thought in the ministry, I thought, God, you know, you do have a sense of humor. You send us out, and the first thing you have to make us do to a person, the, world, the whole world out there is saying, make them feel good first. And the whole thing we have to do before we can ever minister to somebody is make them feel bad. And I, and I think, you know, God, this doesn't make sense. Uh, is there any other way to tell them? You're a no good, dirty, rotten sinner and you're headed for hell. How's that, you know, how's that make you feel? Well, we don't say it in those terms, of course, but we do have to say you're a sinner. Uh, you're not good enough to save yourself. You don't measure up to God's standards. You've got to change your mind about Christ. You're not good enough to work your way to heaven. That cuts the flesh. That doesn't make it feel good. But yet that's what we have to do. So if a person here is natural or carnal, guess what we have to do before we can have true fellowship? Make them feel bad. You need to get saved. You need to get right. Then we can have fellowship. Okay, that's the second thing with regard to fellowship. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verse number 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life, meaning Jesus Christ, was manifested. We have seen it. We bear witness and show that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. Now, please understand, this is a kingdom portion of Scripture. However, it still um, illustrates the principle that I'm talking about here. And uh, as we have time, we'll go to, to Paul to illustrate it as well. But it's better, it, it's better said here in what we want to um, uh, bring out. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Now, why did they make this declaration? Why did John say, I've been in the presence of Jesus Christ. Now remember, by this time, Jesus Christ had already been in heaven for many years, and he had not had the fellowship of Jesus Christ. By this time, John was very old, and he was ready to go be with the Lord himself in, in heaven. But he was still testifying, I've touched Jesus Christ. But regardless of, of that fact, he's gone now. But I still want to have fellowship with you. OK, so he's making an appeal to spiritual people, but especially to natural and carnal people to believe like he does. True Christian fellowship is based on like mindedness. So why does he declare these things that you also may have fellowship with us? Now, I want you to note point number one here. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. There is no Christian fellowship without first that person being in fellowship with God. Other than that, they're natural and they're carnal, and you can have limited fellowship with them, even an enjoyable fellowship with these people. But you cannot have Christian fellowship. It is an impossibility. True Christian fellowship is based, first of all, on your having and my having fellowship with Jesus Christ. All right. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. OK, he's going to give us the principle here of how we, first of all, have fellowship with God. God is absolute truth. James says that there is no shadow of turning. There is no variableness with him. He is pure light, indicative of the fact that his total being is truth, absolute truth. In him is no darkness at all. Therefore, it gives us the precedent. If we want to have fellowship with God, guess what we have to do? Walk in the light. That's what he's going to say here. 
This is the message which we have heard of him. Verse 5, declare to you God is light. In him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So, anybody who comes to a church service, wherever they are, and says, I love God, I'm in fellowship with God, but in all actuality, uh, is not filled with the Spirit to have this apparatus on, or is not truly saved, is lying. Immediately, they have ulterior motives. Immediately, they're playing the part of a hypocrite. They're there for another reason. They're there for another purpose. Whether it's to make themselves feel good, have somebody else make them feel good, con the, the, the preacher, con the congregation. Is there something special, real, real spiritual, when in all actuality they are nothing. They're walking in darkness and they're lying. And, uh, and I've been in the business long enough to, uh, as I said before, to realize that people play these games. Uh, they want to somehow come to church and put a punch a, a little time clock uh, and uh, and come to church and be you know adjust their halo and be a certain way and and influence people and impress upon them others their great spirituality when you know in all actuality that they really don't mean it there's no basis for it they're not interested it's just a show and that's what he's talking about here but says verse seven. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship, note this, one with another. Now, the whole thing here is fellowship with God first, and then as we all walk in the light, we have fellowship one with the other. True Christian fellowship is only based, therefore, upon other people being in fellowship with God first. Then and only then you can be in fellowship with someone else. Other than that, they are still the enemies of God and the enemies of Jesus Christ. All in emotional revolt of the soul. Now, what is emotional revolt of the soul? It is two things. One, where the emotions reflux back into the soul and take charge of your volition. Now, what are the uh, emotions? The emotions, number one, as God truly created them, are appreciators that can make us feel good. But if they do not appreciate God, they want to appreciate something else. Most usually it's just the, the feeling in the flesh. Uh, and that's why, of course, you have all of these means of trying to make the flesh feel good. Uh, so it refluxes back into the soul and grabs a hold of your volition. You remember Romans chapter 7 where the Apostle Paul says, uh, I, I want to do this, but I can't seem to do it. And I hate doing this, but, you know, but I'd end up doing it anyway and so forth. And Romans chapter seven is the struggle of Paul saved, but not knowing how to control the old Adamic nature. He wanted to serve God and he was saved. But uh, these these mechanics, he, he wasn't sure of how to apply them all. And so therefore he was up and down, up and down. Talk about the yo-yo syndrome with the diet. He was the yo-yo. Uh, I just saw Miss Marilyn there grab, the, grab her shawl. I'm sorry. Here I am sweating. It, it, uh, it rem I know some of you think that we should name this church the first church of the deep freeze. You know, have the pastor, Dr. Jack Frost. You know, the verse of Scripture said that many are called and few are chosen. It's many are cold and a few are frozen. I know that's what you ought to, to call it. Okay, where was I? Back in. <laughs> Just, I'm, I'm, I do apologize for that, but uh, I'm soaking wet. All right. Uh, you know, <laughs> for a man who doesn't believe in in, in water baptism per, per se, I've not had a lot of trouble with water. <laughs> Whether it's flooding or rain or perspiring or whatever. Okay. Uh, where was I? I was talking. What was it? <laughs> Romans 7. Paul, that, and finally, you come to Romans 8 where he learned 
how to control the flesh and neutralize it. Other than that, you have a struggle with your emotions. They revolt against the soul. It's your own ego that wants to feel apart from God. And so it comes back in and it controls your volition. Now that's the second thing that it does. If you have something or someone else in control of your volition, guess what? You are going to do what it dictates you to do. And that's why Paul says, I don't want to do it, but I end up doing it anyway. And he had a trouble with emotional revolt of the soul, which means that it comes back in, grabs a hold of your volition, and then makes you, secondly, do what it wants you to do, rather than what God wants you to do. That's why it's important with this, with the, the gap concept. This means that you are free from the old sin nature. That's the outer end of the filling of the Holy Spirit. And it's the only way where you have true fellowship with God. And as I'm teaching here, it's the only way that we can have true fellowship with one another. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 5. In verse, verse number six, the last part of the verse, because of these things comes the wrath of God on the children of disobedience. Don't be partakers with them, therefore. For ye were sometimes darkness, walking in darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. It's the same concept. Walk in the light as he is in the light to have fellowship with him. That's how fellowship is acquired and sustained. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Therefore, prove what is acceptable to, Lord, to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So if people come to your church and they're natural or carnal, guess what they are? They're in the dark. Now, it's not that you berate them or malign them or purposely attack them. Of course not not. But you must keep in mind why they're there. Your job is to try to get them uh, through the proper mechanics that God has provided to make the decision to be like you, not allow them to get you to be like them. One more, and we're almost out of time. Second Corinthians here, chapter 6. Verse number 14. I'm sure there are people who have asked for these tapes with regard to the doctrine of the remnant. <laughs> I'm sure this number 11 has nothing to do with the remnant, but it does. You see, the remnant, those that are in that small portion of that total body of people, are those who are saved and in fellowship. The natural man and the carnal man are part of the problem. They are the reason things happen in history that are detrimental to, to a nation, to a family, to a person. Only those who are saved and in fellowship are those who make an impact historically, who make an impact angelically, who make an impact uh, uh, in society. Only those can make an impact on a community. All right, verse number 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And here is the good phrase. You see, we've always used this verse with regard to marriage, but it, it is not just that. It is on a far a broader scale. The yoke is where you are so attached so involved, so influenced, so associated, I'll use the word strapped, so strapped to another person or relationship that, that they keep you from, from serving Jesus Christ. And that's what it's talking about, the unequal yoke together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And the, uh, this is 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, middle part. 
And that's the whole point here. Even though, of course, we want natural people to come to church. This is how they're going to hear the gospel. We want carnal people to come to church. This is how they're going to get right. It's through the application of the spoken word to, to their life. But we do have to realize that fellowship with them is limited to those areas because we cannot allow them to, to turn us um, in, in any way from our spiritual status. What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? And Belial means uh, with someone who is worthless. Now, I, I understand I'm calling our friends and neighbors here worthless, but that's what it means to be lost, it means to be worthless. It means to be a natural man and a carnal man. Uh, what you do is worthless. It doesn't amount to anything. It's those who are saved and in fellowship. What part has he that believes with an infidel? And that's why verse 17 tells us, come out from among them and be separate. Don't touch the unclean thing. Now, it doesn't mean we do not touch their lives. We don't care about them, pray for them, and have what kind of proper fellowship with them that um, we can have. It just simply means they're at church often for another reason as to why we are at church. And churches full of these kind of people out of fellowship or unsaved are doing these friendly, touchy-feely things to work a crowd to keep them in their darkness. Our job is to be friendly, kind, gracious, concerned to bring them, as Paul's commission tells us, from darkness to what? Light. Light.